Jivanji, dear brothers, sisters, greetings from my hello, namaste and good afternoon to you all. I think we have to start by highlighting one point. If we are talking about decent work for migrant workers, we should understand that this is very much related to decent work for everyone. Because decent work deficits in countries of origin is the main reason why people want to actually migrate and go to other countries. And when they go to the destination countries, the simple conditions in that country is also probably the reason why migrant workers are also suffering from, uh, from all these uh, working conditions. So that's why I think we have to promote decent work for all and decent work everywhere. That's the role of the ILO and that's why we promote our conventions and we promote implementation of the conventions. Now coming back to your question, if you look at the migration trends, the number of labor migrants increasing, increasing trend. There are push factors, <coughs> pull factors, and it will continue to increase. One reason is the labor shortages in many countries, especially developed countries, where um, there is an aging population, so they need a young labor force. On the other hand, there are also other push factors like wars, like climate change. People are not able to, uh, to be employed maybe in the same jobs that, were, that, used to, that, that they were used to be employed. So migration will be very much also linked with the climate change. And also we see also forced displacement of people due to wars, due to natural disasters, so refugees are also, uh, uh, you know, in, can be included in this group. But we have to also see other factors here, like technological advancements, replacement of uh, jobs, disruption of certain jobs, and creation of new jobs. And we have to, to think how we can skill migrant workers that they can take these new jobs. And thinking of demography, for example, there will be more need for care work. So how can we also um, make, the, make migrant workers skills so that they can take this care work, but in a good condition? But we have to also understand some political trends. In the same countries that are having labor shortages, we see more rise of nationalism, protectionism, xenophobia, there is this rhetoric. <laughs> okay, so I have, I try to raise my voice. We also see this country balancing trends, political trends, this rhetoric against migrants, migrant workers. So we have to deal with this all at the same time, and we have to promote safe, orderly, and regular migration as outlined by the global uh, the compact for migration. And the best way to do it is through bilateral labor migration agreements. But let me stop here. I think maybe in the right thing next time we can touch. Thank you, uh, Norman. I, I would like to basically uh, have a follow-up question to uh, to that because I was also coming to that uh, earlier. Uh, you know, ILO has the mandate, as a UN organization, has the mandate to support the uh, member states to set the standards, also to have the bilateral agreements, like bilateral labor agreement. And we have this global compact for migration that also talks about the decent work agenda. Uh, however, uh, many evidence have suggested that um, you know, realizing these uh, instruments and frameworks into practice has faced a lot of challenges. Uh, one of the major problems being uh, the countries of origin or the destination uh, fail at being unable to hold uh, the employers or those involved with the supply chain accountable in the protection and the promotion of the migrant workers. Right? What is the role of the uh, ILO in this? 
and uh, you know what has been the experience so far because the one single state uh, as Lakshman Dai mentioned earlier, cannot have that kind of bargaining power with the destination country. That has been the experience of at least South Asian uh, countries. So there is a need, it seems, for the international uh, effort, or effort from uh, the UN organizations like uh, yours. So going forward, uh, where we should be going uh, based on your experience? I think here we can talk about different levels of cooperation. So on the one hand, we can talk about bilateral cooperation, which means bilateral labor migration agreements between two governments. But we can also talk about multilateral, involving international organizations, or the sending countries coming together and to create a force. And we see this uh, in, the, in the South and Southeast Asia, uh, you know, under, under the SARC, the Colombo process, so these countries try to come together and actually defend the rights of the workers that they are sending abroad. So this is a, it's a good one. And as the ILO, we are trying, we have a project actually on this governance of labor migration in South and Southeast Asia, where we try to work with the governments, try to make them first aware and make them uh, defend the rights of migrant workers in the destination countries. And also, we work with the destination countries themselves in a way so that they have more implementation capacity and enforcement capacity of the labor laws that they have. So this is an important aspect. If you don't have labor inspection systems, if you don't have labor law, if you don't have labor administration, and if you don't have the framework which sees migrant workers having equal rights as local, as local workers, then it's not going to work. So this is, uh, this is something that we are trying to help. Also under um, the, the South Asia region, we try to create a qualifications reference framework in order to mutually recognize the qualification qualifications of migrant workers in those countries, in participating countries, which will help when these countries' migrant workers go abroad, they will be able to easily show their qualifications and there will be a reference framework to do that. Already some uh, two countries have adopted and for Nepal we expect soon this reference framework to be adopted by the cabinet. So this type of you know, coordination work and work with the, with the governments but also at the same time, of course, with our uh, trade union partners. This is an important part, but I leave it to, to Mr. Basnet to, because without this, we cannot achieve. And I second also what you have said. Trade unions need to organize migrant workers. This is one of the most important aspects. I mean, okay, we have to uh, also defend their rights in destination countries, but what about our countries? If we take Nepal, for example, um, in the Trade Union Act, there is a requirement to be a ne Nepali citizen to become a trade union official. So these type of things we are looking now at uh, when since the country is, uh, is uh, considering ratifying Convention 87, is a gap because this can be based on residency, but not necessarily on citizenship, because this would uh, discourage migrant workers to become union members. Thank you. Yeah. Completely agree uh, that you, if you don't give the opportunity and rights for the migrants in your countries to be organized, then it's a challenge for us to bargain with the destination countries. So, uh, the, the policies and the laws of the origin country also needs to be um, to be um, uh, you know addressed. Um, now I would like to come to Lakshmandai. Uh, I think no one also mentioned about the problem and challenges that um, that uh, we face in terms of the inspections and the monitoring of the workplaces. Uh, and uh, as you know, that most of our diplomatic missions are busy in their daily administrative work and they can't really uh, visit those places and even they don't have access to most of these um, employers. 
Uh, so, and there are also uh, some practices about the bilateral relationship uh, between some trade unions of Nepal. Say, G Fund has some uh, partnership, trade union Congress has some partnership with the trade unions uh, in the destination countries also. Uh, so, you know, when there is no such mechanism, bilateral mechanisms to inspect, it's very, uh, I think, impractical. Uh, to expect that there would be the effective monitoring of the workplaces or um, or uh, we don't know whether they've been paid properly or the working condition is decent or not. Uh, so going forward, what is your take on this? What is your suggestions for better and effective monitoring of um, migrant workers' uh, working condition? Thank you, Yuji. I mean, this is uh, monitoring and bilateral uh, relationship with other trade union has been uh, discussed and we are trying that, we are, we do have that. But what I would like to say is, first of all, the migrant worker has to be fully aware what are my choices there, what do I get there, where, where am I going there. And this is called pre-orientation, pre-departure, post-departure, training has been there extensively. Otherwise, they don't know what to do, where to, uh, who to ask. One is that. We have to prepare our, like I prepared my son and daughter to go outside and study. And the same thing has to be prepared, very meticulously prepared, very meticulously, because they are our heroes. If they don't go, we will have no fuel, no, no food, nothing in certain, some countries. That's one thing is there. The second thing is skill. In Indian workers here coming, we have a free border and we have agreement. We can work in India, India can work here. They come here, same amount of maybe more money, so guests from the next next program are already here. So so it's here. What I was saying very shortly. 10% of migrant workers making more money in, in Nepal and take more money to India than what we, the whole of migrant workers at present bringing uh, from outside, uh, uh, from uh, uh, remittance. That kind of difference is there. Third thing is, with the same amount of, uh, at present, same amount of migrant workers, we can Triple our uh, uh, remittances. Triple our remittances. Because we have to give benefit to them. They are selling their uh, rem uh, remittances in the market there. So the government has to look into it. Why should we send so many people to get the, a smaller amount of money? Whereas if we send, if the government is looking for the money, I mean remittances, they can get uh, more money from foreign country with the exact amount of uh, salaries what they are getting three to four times more now other thing what i demand there has to be a united governance united governance with uh, un agency what what un has done they have made a, a, a migrant migration network. But I want to see that the payment is made correctly, the labor law has been enforced correctly in the destination countries. If the workers is wrong, they have, they have to be penalized. If the employer or the government are wrong, they have to be enforced. Because non-payment, uh, less payment, like uh, Sister Manjuji said, and half payment, no payment, three months or uh, uh, dumping, labor dumping in the country of destination, labor dumping, like it's a product. 
What's detention? Those things are all. So there has to be one uh, 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 mechanism. And UN must make it. It's my demand that UN must make it. That some kind of mechanism has to be made so that migrant workers, there is a proper contract, one, implementation of contract, two, and fulfillment of the contract up to the returning point. This has to be done. Otherwise, I mean, countries are being, getting vacated by the young people. We don't have any more young people. The demand is growing all over, and you, have, you said very correctly. In one side, the migrant uh, workers are demand is growing. Other side is xenophobia and nationalism, ultra nationalism. Some of the European, they are now they are going to Europe, and extreme extremism, extreme nationalism has uh, developed there. No, we don't want migrant workers. Okay, we won't go there. But if you need it, we have to have the respect, equal rights. Only one place I have seen, heard, that's a, uh, Portugal. During the COVID period, they gave equal right to the uh, migrant workers, same uh, facilities, same uh, handouts, like social security. See, see. So, so social security had to be there to decide what then we can benefit. Vasundai, um, you've been talking about the portability of social security. That was one of the um, challenges facing the uh, migrant workers uh, from South Asia. How do you see uh, this portability or uh, portability of insurances and uh, uh, social security of the migrant workers being realized? It's, it's a very, very, very simple mechanism, but it's a complex mechanism. That. You have to uh, you have to have an agreement between Belgium and India. There is an agreement that uh, Indians working in Belgium they get full second social security. Belgians working in uh, India they are getting full security and portable security. So uh, the only one thing is uh, there social security it follows you wherever you go. It's like a network. It's a national network. I work today in uh, Nepal. My social security will deposit in uh, my country of origin. Next year, I will work in India. My uh, social security will be deposited. There's a, there's a f uh, fast uh, money transfer. It can be done. There's no, if, you, if, you, if you are in one country and run a business in another country, why can't the workers get that benefit? Similarly, whatever the business or goods and supplies are getting benefit, workers should get the same benefit. It is not impossible, it's possible. Remittance travel from one place to another place. Why can't my social security travel from one place to another place? And there has to be mechanism and uh, yeah, bilateral agreements. Uh, we've started uh, with uh, Malaysia, uh, so we can also learn uh, lessons and keep improving on that area. Uh, when coming to Manjuji, Manjuji, you talk about uh, the implications of uh, policies being uh, restricted uh, for the uh, migration of uh, women migrant workers and how it has been affected uh, uh, our migrant workers. Uh, I, will, I will come back to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have uh, our member of parliament, uh, is uh, our big friend of the trade union, Dr. Sekhar Koyalala. I would like to just introduce him to you, Dr. Koyalala. He is here. So, on our request, he is for the next program, he is one of the main speakers. Thank you. Thank you, um, Lasantai. Uh, I was coming to uh, the challenge is facing the migrant workers because of the policy, restrictive policy. So going forward, what kind of policies should be in place in order to ensure the regular pathways that Numan had uh, mentioned earlier, particularly for the, the women migrant workers from Nepal or uh, from uh, South Asian regions? Um, first of all, uh, our constitution has uh, mentioned that uh, employment is the fundamental rights of any citizen that has to be respected first. And as uh, brother has mentioned about the skill, 
and pre-departure orientation training, then it exists there, the mechanism, though it's not functioning very properly, but it's, that is still there. But the, regarding the women's issue, I have a little bit different school of thought than uh, brother. Who goes for foreign labor migration in, the, uh, uh, in, in relation with the women migrant workers of Nepal? The women who have not recognized by their respective community, society, they are socially, politically, culturally excluded. They don't have access to information, then how do they get to know about the information regarding safe migration? That is a huge gap. That's why, first of all, uh, my um, question is, we have to empower women. And they, there must be a mechanism, as you mentioned about the governance, um, then there is a huge gap that women migrant workers, they don't get any information regarding migratory process. From the beginning, they are facing challenges. That's why there is a still existing mechanism uh, as uh, Sami, uh, uh, from the Molest, Sami has information, MRCs, but the, the, these women, they don't have access to get the information from their home village to the information center. There's a huge gap. That's why massive information dissemination has to be done, uh, one thing, and empowerment is another thing. The other thing is like uh, the existing ban has to be lifted. For that, we need a solidarity from the uh, uh, trade union, as we have mentioned, as you also mentioned about the GCM, there must be a whole of society, a whole of government. Um, uh, 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 that approach has to be uh, implemented. In that case, then we can ensure the safer migration of women migrant workers, uh, ensure the respect and the workers' dignity, uh, digni uh, right to health, right to privacy, and state uh, duty is to protect the human rights of uh, women migrant workers, including all migrants, and also uh, uh, the access to effective re remedy. So we have to remove the ban first, and then all these things will come automatically uh, in, in the entire cycle of, of women migrant workers, and we are talking about the migration governance. So right to work and uh, right to choice, the occupation has to be ensured. Thank you, uh, Manjuji. I think uh, at times, uh, some, uh, at times, trade unions themselves and the representatives have been part of these policies. So maybe it's also high time that we need to be reflecting on uh, our, uh, our uh, positions in some of these very crucial um, uh, crucial issues because, as you know, how the restri restrictions were imposed in Nepal that you know, that was based on a very brief visit to the destination countries and that also included the participants of uh, trade unions and uh, at times civil society organizations as well. So we need to be reflecting on uh, our movements and our uh, activities on this as well. Now I would like to come to. Um, uh, Yoshidaji, uh, I think Manjuji rightly mentioned that there is a need for uh, a building movement, but not only among the trade unions themselves, but it has to be among the civil society or the like-minded groups working on this uh, on this area. Um, what is your take on this? Uh, or if you have any experience about working with other stakeholders um, to, to improve uh, uh, migration governance or to improve the migrant worker situation? Yes, the IUC has been proposing to uh, to renegotiate the uh, social contract. But to this end, that uh, we have to build up the new countervailing power to make a changes, rules of economy and rules of politics. To this end, you know, that the trade union should go beyond traditional trade unions to further associate or cooperate with a like-minded individual or organization, which place at the most value at the decent work for all. 
it's nothing to do with the migration, but the taking as an example the, what has been happening in India. So trade union and farmers organized a national wide strike, 2020, and also the yesterday. And uh, last one I know led to the government you know, uh, uh, being forced to repeat the farmer's, uh, farmer's bill. So this is one of the examples for the great potential for trade unions to work with the other, other group of the society. So let me say again that, the, of course, you know, trade unions first have to organize more members, including the migrant workers and those engaged in the informal economy, but at the same time, why don't you hesitate you know, to go beyond, beyond the, our tradition? to associate with the uh, new new uh, new I mean new new friend you know so no matter how they are uh, no matter which area they have been working. So this is my uh, last comment. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to I think we're coming to the end of this discussion so I'd like to come to Nuanji. Uh, as you've heard uh, from the panelists, uh, many of the issues are very much related to uh, the reluctance in the part of the destination country and the employers. And you've been working with all these three sectors uh, uh, to uh, uh, improve the policies. Particularly in the context of Gulf and Malaysia, uh, most of the policies are not migrant friendly. I know that ILO has been trying very hard, but the success is very low, uh, at least based on my experience. There are some progresses, but still uh, the compliance uh, is very low, and laws are still not migrant friendly. Uh, so uh, from the UN perspective and the, from the alliances that we are talking about, uh, what is the way going forward, or how is ILO working uh, in this area? Yes, thank you. Uh, Malaysia is on our agenda in a way. We have a specific, in, in the case of Nepali migrant workers, we have a specific project ongoing now, which is primarily working for improving rights of migrant workers in destination countries. So for this, we work out at two different levels. One at the government level here uh, for more policy frameworks so or to create a migration policy for Nepal. Now this work is, is ongoing and to increase the capacity of the ministry to negotiate better bilateral labor migration agreements. And uh, recently there was uh, there were two MOUs, with, one with uh, Germany, one with Romania. So these agreements were in a way facilitated by ILO. And in these agreements we try to put clauses related to, to social protection, social security and, and the rights aspects. But the other dimension is also equally important. The Nepali missions abroad, the consulates, the embassies, they need to be strengthened first uh, to provide better services to migrant workers so their human resources capacity need to be increased and improved. And for this we have developed some guidelines and uh, standard operating procedures in a way for the, for the uh, staff of the Nepali missions abroad. And this is going to be first uh, piloted in Malaysia. So the embassies will have the capacity, but also migrant workers need to know also that these services are available to them, that they can go to the consulates and they can get these services. So this is going to be uh, you know, happening in, in Malaysia. This is one of our priority as well. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. I think we've come to the end of this discussion. Uh, I would like to thank all the distinguished panelists uh, for your very uh, thoughtful and uh, valuable uh, contribution to this discussion. I would like to uh, thank all the participants uh, and I would like to thank uh, NTUC uh, once again. Uh, thank you very much. I relevant issue before the panelists.
Uh, first of all, I thank the Nepal Trade Room Congress, uh, President uh, Brother Yoginder Kamar uh, and uh, General Secretary uh, Brother Rajay Rai and other office bearers. They have uh, very um, selected this uh, uh, subject to discuss in the World Social Forum 2024. Uh, you have uh, mentioned two issues, migration and uh, decent deployment. And decent deployment is one of the agenda of the Sustainable Development Goal. And uh, now five years is left. Uh, I am sharing with you because uh, a World Social Forum is the alternative. Because in the Asia Pacific, no government has any agenda of migration or so job security of the informal worker. And they should be given a decent job, decent wage, occupational health and safety, or the employment. Every, everywhere, you can see the violation of all existing ILO conventions. And uh, now, the how we can achieve, because this is one of the biggest challenge before the trade union. We have to discuss and I, I would also request uh, to all panelists, they, they should uh, give the reply on that. I know ILO have a um, platform of decent country program. In that, we have raised this issue and that is in the agenda and uh, all partners agree to implement. But sorry to mention that not even a single migrant is going from their country due to the poverty due to the unemployment to the other countries for their livelihood without any legal documents. They are going as a tourist and then they manipulated through the agent as a work permit and then they started to work as a boundary labor, boundary labor. But uh, I have one um, important question I, I, I am discussing with my Indian government also. Employer want that labor law should be flexible. There should not be any inspection of any sector. So that they should give the full liberty for hire and fire. And all government.